everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. We're big, we're bad, and we're back. And we're going to be talking about microphones today. Yes, microphones. Um, what is great about this is we've done, I don't know how many microphone demos. Blah, 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 make up a number. 50? 100? We've done a schnizzle ton of microphone demos. So I have a lot of prior knowledge, but I'm still going to call and have a chat with Mike at Sweetwater and see what he thinks. And between the two of us, I'll take some suggestions from him, of course, and also order the things that I like as well. Now, good news for me, and of course for all of you, is that Lewitt, a company we have done a lot of demos for, are now actually in Sweetwater. So let's start with that. Mike, how are you? Hey, Warren. Good to hear from you. How you been? Rather good. Rather good. And like I said, I'm, I'm excited that... Uh, Lewitt are in Sweetwater because there's all these different microphones that I love and Lewitt are one of them. And so it makes life easier. We don't have to talk around it and I can just be like, I can get everything I need from one place. So definitely yeah, great mics. I know that you love them. So yeah, that we can definitely talk about some of those. Yeah. Fantastic. I, so for me, um, if we start like we normally do, we don't have to start off with Lewitt. We can start off with a few things. Well, first of all, I think before we even get stuck into microphones, let's do like the 101 what are the differences between microphones? Because you know the purpose of these videos is for really everybody to watch, so beginners all the way through to you know professionals. But for the basic kind of discussion, we have um, there are more types. So I know people are going to say there's more types, there's a, there, but generally speaking, the typical mics that are sold are fall into three categories: dynamic, condenser, and ribbon. Um, so. What would you, what, how would you describe each of those? I want to throw you under the bus. So a dynamic <laughs> microphone to you, um, what are its main uses? Yeah, definitely. Well, so a, a dynamic microphone is, a, it's a capsule attached or a diaphragm attached to a coil that then sits around a, a, a magnet. So it's in this magnetic field. It's going to react, of course, to changes in, in pressure, sound pressure level from whatever source you're recording with it and those fluctuations in in sound of course are going to be converted into in, into voltage so that's how a dynamic microphone actually works um they tend to round off transients um in, in a in a nice way in many cases so you'll find them on drums and high spl sources an awful right. lot and um, spl meaning sound pressure levels basically sound pressure level loud sources loud sources like electric guitar amps and drums and things like that Absolutely. And not as a, as a rule, but yeah, generally we'll find them on, on those sources. You also find people using them on, on, on vocals, you know, Bruce Wedeen using the SM7 on, on Michael Jackson's vocals on Thriller or Bono using them um, or on, on his vocal, I guess he uses a 57. Yeah. Paul Rogers as well. I've been, I, I was told by somebody who recorded Paul Rogers uses, a, I believe a handheld 57 recording vocal. Huh. And, and Vance Powell will use them on a lot of stuff when he's going yep. for a certain sound. I mean, there's no there's no rule as to where things can or can't be used, of course. And I, people have recorded entire kits with 57s and had them sound amazing. I guess one of the challenges, it, it's not going to be necessarily a bad thing all the time, but with a dynamic microphone, they're generally going to roll off reasonably low. You know, 14 to 16K, they start to roll off. Um, and that doesn't necessarily matter. You know, it doesn't mean that you can't use it on, on stuff, but on a... Uh, snare drum for example you're oftentimes going to crank up the the top end it's still not going to have all that information that's up above 16k but you're you're going to be able to use that that mid-range and those high mids to get some of that kind of i think the other the thing snare, for example a good positive for dynamics is that they're very they're much easier to create tight polar patterns um you know such as super cardioid sure. and hyper cardioid and for those of you watching cardioid is exactly what you think it is it's a heart shape so it's like cardioid as in, you know, <laughs> heart. And um, so I find that when I'm doing live recordings, which in my past, I don't know if you, you were probably working with, with me when we did some live recordings, I have done sure. a chrysal ton of them. So mm -hmm. many live recordings. Um, in fact, some of the b bigger artists I've worked with have been live. I did Joe Strummer and um, Blackville Brides and the Chili Peppers and the Ramones and all this stuff. It was all done live. Yep. And... Dynamics become a godsend because they have tight, tighter polar patterns. You've got a band like playing at full volume. 
you can use a dynamic mic on pretty much everything. And the last Definitely. thing, that, frankly, I wanted to do was use a condenser, which would have picked up all the bleed of everything. Yeah, absolutely better off access rejection. And you're right, editing some of that stuff that you mentioned. I worked on a few of those things with you, and it was still a lot of noise from other stuff, a lot of bleed, but it was, you know, could have been worse, of course, with, with different mic selection. Um, so then, of course, you have uh, other options. Ribbons are a dynamic that we can talk about too, but yeah, condenser microphones, that's that's actually a capsule with another capsule or a charged backplate sitting extremely close to it. And then these tiny little fluctuations in voltage there from, from sound pressure um, end up being turned into volts, of course. And that's how we record from a, from a condenser microphone. They require 48 volts or they require phantom power. It's rarely actually 48 volts coming out of a board or an interface any longer, um, if ever, but they need to be charged. They need that source. The good news is that I, I think we might have one or two real low end boards that don't provide phantom power, but pretty much everything does at this right. point. And those condenser microphones are going to be more sensitive to, uh, to transients, more accurate to transients on whatever of a vocal, if you're using them for drum overheads for drum rooms, if you are um, going to be more sensitive to transients, they're also going to be more open on the top end and have a different kind of personality than, than a dynamic. But you're right. in in many cases, they're going to have poor off axis rejection. They're still cardioid microphones in many cases, or it can be switched into other polar patterns, but even in cardioid, they're still going to be more sensitive. So even if they're not exhibiting worse off axis rejection, they're still going to be more sensitive to what's happening in the room. And then at least in a live environment, there is a greater potential for, for feedback in those kind of challenges. At right, least, having at right. least a live environment. I've talked about this uh, a few times before as one of my failings, um, but we did um, the fray live at Abbey Road. Remember they used to do the live at Abbey Road series? And yes. um, I got Isaac, and it's my fault, I got Isaac really excited when tracking at Abbey Road <laughs> to use uh, the U48, that, or AU48 that the Beatles would have used. So he very excitedly asked for a U48. We did put it, it was put into cardioid, but it was him at a piano singing live on a U48 with a band around him. Let's just say it was a real challenge to mix. And it was entirely my fault because I was like, oh, you have to use the same mic as the Beatles, you know? And uh, <laughs> yeah, if you solo the vocal mic, it's pretty much, it's the vocal mic, the piano mic, and the drum mic all at once um, in that order. But um, yeah, um, and then I've done many recordings since, uh, live things, but and with the band, and we'll just put up an SM58. And it's remarkable with some decent EQ and compression, not many people can tell the difference that it's not a thirty or forty thousand dollar condenser. It's actually a hundred dollar dynamic microphone. Um, you know, yeah. you're better off capturing a performance um, with you know a tool that does the job than throwing up something you know incredibly expensive um, and not getting the performance well well captured. Um, you know. Yeah. Exactly, and I think for yeah for for live recordings or for for any recording where you're recording an uh, an entire band, I think yeah the the name of the game is picking the right tools to control the bleed and then embracing the bleed, and making another, sure that things are as face coherent as possible and and kind of using that to your advantage, right? I think another thing that's not talked about enough because frankly there's not many people doing what we do here, which is like recording bands and going into studios or in home studios. Um, is the subtle differences sometimes between microphones um, really influence their choice. There are so many microphones that can do every job, of course. 57 could record a full album um, and has, has happened many, 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 many times. Um, sure. But some of the subtle differences, whether between types of microphones, condensers and, and uh, dynamics and ribbons, really do pin them into certain um, job descriptions. But then within those microphones themselves, like small diaphragm uh, condensers, for instance, are pretty nice on acoustic guitars because they don't quite have the low end response of a large diaphragm condenser. So a small diaphragm condenser is a great thing to have in your arsenal when you want to stick it on an acoustic guitar and you don't need the boominess of the, you know, the sound hole of an acoustic guitar. Um, where the opposite might be true of a grand piano, you might want to put large diaphragm condensers on there, especially if the grand piano is the only thing in the mix other than the vocal. You would want that extended low end. So those are very simple explanations, but I think that's something else that um, 
you know, is, is definitely worth uh, touching on. So sure. ribbons, what can you tell us about ribbons? Yeah, so a ribbon microphone is an extremely thin piece of, uh, of aluminum, well thinner than a, than a human hair. You're talking micron thick. So it is extremely sensitive to SPL and, and movement. Meaning not necessarily the best choice to put on um, a Marshall stack, double stack at full volume. Well, but you'll find that that's one of the most popular microphones for 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 recording. I, I have them sitting at home in in my studio right now on a on a two twelve. Sitting there, are you talking that's pretty loud? What mics are you talking? You're talking about things like Royer one twenty ones. Sure. So one twenty ones, um, and you find so so one twenty ones. At least from my experience, they don't have as nearly as much of a proximity effect. So you find that they're right up on the grill of an amp, whereas you might find like a more classic ribbon design like a, an AEA and an R84 or something like that you might back well off you know when you see when you hear recordings of um, Sinatra and he sounds like he's right up on that microphone then you see pictures where it's six feet away I suppose you could have some stage photos too but there there's no doubt that those kind of classic microphones a 44 or an 84 um, which are what all the AEA ones are, are based on to some degree those classic ribbon designs I mean they have a huge proximity effect even from a distance so you'll find that those are further off and maybe picking up more of the room but um, yeah generally an R121 and a, and, a, and a 57 on a on a guitar amp and blend those um, I suppose it would be wise to put your hand in front of it and kind of feel how much air is actually rushing into the ribbon before you put it there um, I've used pot filters on the front of it to try to control that a little bit um, but they sound great they're pretty low output so there's a few options you know if you put them on a guitar amp you put them on a on drums usually somewhere in the room you can most of the time get plenty of gain get enough gain out of your interface or your preamp that you're using um to to get to a a decent recording level um i find that if i'm using on on a guitar amp or i actually use them for my for my drum rooms at this point those are royer 121s i can get gain out of my my pre's without getting to the point where there's too much self noise of the the preamp. Um, now, if you're using on a, a more delicate, you know, if somebody's playing an acoustic guitar, an acoustic guitar very softly, or a, a vocal, or, or a, something along those lines. Oftentimes, what you'll find is that you end up getting too much self noise or not enough gain. Period out of the the preamp that you're trying to use. So there's a, a few options there. You have things like the cloud lifter and the uh, other boost options. That are out there from various manufacturers that are basically going to give you something like 28 decibels of clean gain before you put that into your preamp. Um, and the point there, of course, is to get it to a usable level that would be more comparable to the level that a, that a condenser microphone would output. Um, the next logical extension of that was to put them in the microphones. So you have the cloud microphones, which are RCA ribbon inspired, and you have the AEA active versions that are available. And these are powered. You, you use we, phantom we power, have like the we're KU about. the KU five A, um, which yeah. is amazing. And we are Absolutely. in the process of demoing the cloud. It may or may not be out before this video um, because it's it's being done at the moment. Um, which I that that new cloud mic, um, I'm very excited to try it out. Yeah, absolutely. I was impressed with them when they were here showing them off so that um, those active versions will have this device built into them. So it requires phantom power. That's how it gets powered. That's how it gives you the extra gain. Um, and at that point, you don't have to worry about having a cloud lifter or anything along those lines. Let's, um, let's face it. And the more I think about it, this is a good time. I mean, when you and I first started recording, it was 57s and Neumanns and AKGs, um, you know, and then a couple of EVs and a couple of buyers. But generally speaking, you know, entry level, you weren't a serious studio until you had a U87, um, which is a great mic, don't get me wrong, but, you know, that's not entry level price. The fact that you can get incredible sounding microphones at a fraction of the cost now, is, it's pretty, pretty, it, pretty it, darn it good. Yeah, it is amazing. It's a good time to, to be into this. You know, there, there's, of course incrementally better equipment yep. oftentimes as the price goes up, but it's amazing what we can get, whether it's microphones yep. or interfaces or whatever at I a lower price point. Talk about it with mastering uh, with mastering engineers. Um, you, for a certain price point, a, a pretty good price point, you can get like 99% of the best sounding master ever. The, the reality is, is like with anything at the top end, you have to pay a lot more to get, as you said, the word I liked, incremental increases. Um, 
but a thousand dollar fifteen hundred well between one and two thousand dollar microphone now I think is, is some of the best made microphones ever. I can't believe how many great things uh, are being made. And so those all use phantom power to power the, the booster or the active aspect of that of the active ribbon microphones. Um, I guess one thing to, to make perfectly clear here is that most ribbons, passive ribbon microphones, are not going to want to see phantom power. Um, I will not say that people, myself included, but others that have worked in my room, I, I know for a fact have applied phantom to my 121s and my 84s, and thankfully they've lived to tell about it, but I think the danger is... I cannot confirm phantom. or deny that I may have accidentally <laughs> done that once or twice in my career. But every, exactly. Everybody's made that mistake. Everybody's made that mistake. Yeah, and thankfully they, they usually keep ticking, but yeah, it's something to be aware of, so I wouldn't want to confuse yeah. active and passive ribbons in, in that respect. Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, you, you know, you can use passive... Um, mics and not worry about the phantom situation if you've got uh, a cloud lifter, et cetera, in, you know, in the chain. Sure. Yeah, if it's there, it needs to and wants to see phantom and you're definitely not going to have it short out on the, on the ribbon and pop a ribbon, for example. But, um, yep, it's worth being aware of. Yeah, definitely. Well, look, let's start, let's talk about some, uh, some different mic options. So I think any, I don't want to say this, any serious studio, home studio guy or girl, I, it's such a, a big claim. But anybody, you know, starting off, if you're just going to get the one mic that's going to get you through, through things and that people are going to appreciate by walking in and thinking that you know what you're doing, it's probably going to be a sure SM57. Now, I know so many great microphone companies have made their 57 beaters, you know, in fact, every company we're going to talk about has a dynamic microphone that may actually have a better frequency response and may even have higher sound pressure levels and may even be the same price or cheaper. So I don't want to, I don't want to dismiss other people's uh, uh, microphones because I, I, I love them in that because there are other comparable things. But there is one thing you can say about a 57 is if you have one, you know what it's going to sound like and you know what it's going to do. Um, for me, if I hear a snare drum sound I like, it's usually a 57, probably on a Ludwig superphonic snare drum Definitely. going through a Neve 1073 or an API into an 1176. To me, that's the sound of a snare drum. It's most snare drums that were ever recorded. Not all, but the, a majority of them is that kind of chain. So having a 57 in your arsenal, I mean, how much do you have them up for now? Let's have a look. Those are going to go for, they're probably still in the $99 range, we would, would imagine, which is what I think yeah. my first one must have cost when I bought it decades ago. Yeah, I mean... Same price, 90, 90 bucks, $99? I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll reiterate, you could buy uh, any of the companies we're going to talk about, their version of a uh, Dynamic in that price range, and they're probably just as good, maybe even better. However, how do you define better? When you're talking about a microphone like this, which has a certain sound especially that presence lift between so three to 5K, which makes snare drums just a little bit snappier, makes electric guitars just a little bit more aggressive. It's just, it's a sound that you, you know and love and can rely on. So I think, you know, I've been doing all the talking here, but um, I, I'm sure you still sell bucket loads of them. We send out a ton of those. Like you were saying, the, we, we know the sound, you know, yep. for, for better or worse. You know exactly yep. what the 57 is going to sound like, and you know exactly what you're going to, to fix on it, if anything. Um, so, yeah, oftentimes those are on my, my, my snare drum uh, and, and guitar amps. I have one on, on a guitar amp with the 121 right now, actually, at, at, at home. Um, there, there are other options. Like you said, you know, Audix makes their i5, which is I like Audix a lot. Yeah, yep. great company. Yeah, definitely. A little, little different, different EQ curve yep. to those. Um, and, you know, my, my first experience with, with Audix probably was when we were at, at, at Swing House and we didn't have any in the studio, but I would occasionally borrow those from, from Live World, from some of the rehearsal. Well, rooms. remember we used the D5 on the kick sometimes because it already has that kind of scoopy attack. And, and this, was, this was like 16, 17 years ago, and they've become almost a standard for most metal producers now use Audix microphones because they've got They've got that kind of scooped out, already EQ'd, immediately sounds good. Um, do you remember those 
those kind of like little mini Audix 87 clones that we used to use yeah. on the back wall. Room mics. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Those were amazing. I don't even remember what models they were. Um, we should try and find out. C-111s? What were they Maybe? called? Were they C-111s? Let's have a look. Am I making that up? I don't know. We'll find out. I'm going to look it up. Doing it in real time. CX-111. Sorry. CX-111. Yeah, there they are. Those are amazing. That's the sound of how to save a life. That's the drum sound. That's the rooms. Yeah, and they sounded great in that in that room. Yeah. I mean, as I recall, you guys got kind of lucky on on what that room ended up sounding like. Just uh, it was a rehearsal yeah. Well, room we did a lot of hit and miss. And... I mean, I was moving panels yeah. around the walls, like thinking I knew what I was doing. Um, <laughs> you, you know, it was definitely hit and miss, um, mm -hmm. but it did end up sounding good. And it's always experimentation, like we talked about before. I mean, this is what we what we talked about in the yep. acoustics video. There's always experimentation to figure out how the room's going to sound. Um, took me several years to figure out how to make my room sound right and sound bigger, and it all comes down to, yep. to experimentation. So let's get a 57. I currently have a M201 from from uh, from Bayer, actually uh, Bayer Dynamic. I have one of those on the snare right now. Placing it a little differently than I usually do a, a 57, it, it needs a little bit of help getting the the, the bite. Uh, that a 57 usually produces, but I really like that as well. But you're never going to go wrong with 57. On, yeah. On, no, I agree. Now, I'm going to make some of, while we're, because we talked about Louis at the beginning, and I've obviously got a lot of prior knowledge. I think uh, we get the LCT 040 matched pair of small diaphragm condensers. These, it's $199 for a matched pair of condensers that we've used on overheads and piano. And actually, I, I think we still have them up when we use them. The last time we used them to do um, like a test, we didn't replace them with anything else. I still absolutely love them. We actually did a video with uh, Steve Magora um, and we did everything using those microphones, like recorded the drums, recorded the piano, did the vocal, did the acoustic, did the you know, did the bass, did the electric guitar. So I'm definitely going to put a pair of LC2 040s in that for just because we've got to, and then obviously you can buy them individually at $99. Uh, I, there's a lot of great microphones on the market, um, but those 040s. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I can't say anything bad about them. I was so impressed. When somebody makes a product that is affordable and sounds great, that's it. That to me is what should be a, called a standard. So at the moment we're talking about $99 microphones, all of which are highly recommended. So I'm not an expert on SE, um, but Christian who's sitting here tells me, he's a drummer, he tells me that he really likes the uh, SE V7X, is that correct? which again is another $99 yeah. microphone. And I think it's worth mentioning this. And actually Christian, uh, Christian Kohler, who's a good friend of mine and obviously a great metal producer, also likes using SE mics for that. He uses split between that and Audix a lot. So um, I, I just, it's just worth mentioning, you know, when we're talking about other $99 microphones, you know, we talked, we didn't talk specifically mention any, but you know, here's two people I know and respect that both use the SE. So I'm going to get the 57 because I grew up using it and I know it. I mean, literally grew up using it. The first, I think it was the first like proper microphone I ever had, you know, outside of whatever came free with the first gear I got or whatever I inherited from somebody. Um, but I think the SE uh, V7 is definitely worth, uh, checking out as well. So while we're on SEs, we were looking at the SE7, which is a, li a little bit more expensive, but a matched pair um, come in at $219. Um, you've obviously been selling SE a lot longer than you've been selling Lewitt because you just recently started working with us. What can you tell us about these, um, these SE7s? Yeah, the SE microphones are, are are really good. The SE sevens and the SE eights are going to be their their small diaphragm condensers. Great sounding mics. I I think they probably could and and at one point did sell for far more than this. So having them available at this price point is, is outstanding. Great. Well, let let's get a pair of those because actually I'd like to. They're a little bit more expensive than the um, the Lewitts, but only marginally. They're in the same kind of price range. It'd be great to be able to hear them compared with each other. Um, and um, yeah, I'm obviously a big fan of the Lewitts, but I know that um, 
you know, you guys sell bucket loads. I've used that, I think, three times today so far. Bucket loads <laughs> of these four. Um, so let's hear why. Um, so while we're on SE, there is the 2200E. Yeah, SE2200 is a, a good microphone. It's a large diaphragm that falls in at that $300 kind of price point. And we do send a lot of them out as a as a, a, a people's first condenser microphone, those and um, Audio-Technica AT4040s. There, there's a number of microphones that'll be right in that price point. Uh, Loudon has one with the LA220, I think is right in that, that price point. And like we were talking about earlier, there's it's amazing what we get at this price point. They all have different voicings, but they're all really good microphones at this point. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I'm looking, I think while we're on large diaphragms, um, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, we've got, for me, I recently changed my um, mic that I use for like the voiceover stuff when we're doing like, um, you know, the live mixing stuff online. And I've been digging, really digging the LCT 540, which I think is what probably replaced the original 550, which was their flagship original kind of inexpensive 414 killer. I think this 540S is ridiculous. And I'm looking at it here, you guys are doing it at 699. I don't know what a 414 comes out these days, like 1500 bucks, 1400 bucks, something like that. Essentially, it's about half the price, give or take a few dollars of a, a 414, which in all due respect is another, I hate saying this phrase, but I'm gonna say it, industry standard. A 414 is gonna be in most major studios. Um, particularly the older ones, uh, are still held up as being some of the greatest microphones ever made. Um, and um, But I think for many, many, many people, myself included, we're looking for better value for money. I was going to buy a pair of 414s, I don't know, maybe seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. It was before I started the YouTube channel, so probably eight or nine years ago. And they were going to be for overheads and they were going to be for piano. And I... I, I just was like hovering over the, you know, the buy it button, you know, and I didn't get them because I found out about Lewitt. They were a relatively new company and somebody said, you've got to try them out. And they brought over a pair of the Lewitts. And that's what got me excited because they had a microphone that was two of them for the same price as what I was going to pay for one for 14, something that was going to be on piano and overheads. Um, so for now, me, it's the LCT 540. I really, really dig in this mic. I think for $700, for me, it could be uh, your everything mic. It could be the mono piano mic, uh, acoustic guitar, lead vocal, you know, mono overhead. You know, if you get a pair of them, then obviously everything in stereo. But it's a it's it's a serious butt kicking mic at seven hundred bucks. Um, I know Lewis are relatively new to you, um, so I won't throw you on the spot to talk as. Uh, um, you know, effectively as I'm doing because I have so much prior knowledge of them. But I think we'll definitely get one of those, the 540s. Yeah, and they were here um, just a few weeks ago showing those off, and they really are good-sounding microphones. And like you were saying, that's oftentimes w what people are looking for from the get-go. If somebody's buying yeah. a single condenser microphone, they're looking for something that's not only going to work on everything and do it well. But then the goal, you know, the goal in what we do here, at least how, how I kind of try to put together systems and that kind of stuff is to get that first microphone that we send out shouldn't be just a springboard. It shouldn't be something where somebody says, okay, this will do for now. I it agree. should be something they're going to keep in their closet. And exactly. Use I say that all the time. Yeah. Down the road. Very well said. I, 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 I don't think any of these microphones and it's in the back of my mind the whole time are microphones that are stepping stones to the better mic that you're going to get. Every single one of these mics are mics that you will always have in your locker and will always serve a purpose. And that is a very, very important thing. I, I do in, think in the $300 and below, um, it's crowded, um, but I tend to go for the small diaphragms in that price range. Um, for me, the large diaphragms that really jump out are in the sort of 500 to 1,000 um, that are more utilitarian. It's a difficult one. People come to me all the time and they give me like four or five different microphones that are exactly the same price and say, which one do you prefer? And I was like, you know the one I prefer? The one that's $200 more than this, and you don't, that beats all of these ones. It's a catch-22. Sometimes it's probably worth, if you've got $500 to spend on a large diaphragm, maybe just hold off 
until you can get to something in this price range. Because we've got the LCT540, but also there's things like the Mojave, the MA201 FET, which I've also demoed and absolutely love on my voice, which is closer to like, I think it's, I think it's another hundred dollars more. And that is a wonderful vocal microphone as well. So, and uh, let's have a quick look, price-wise, make sure I'm right. Yeah, $7.99. So for the extra hundred bucks, it's a really fantastic vocal mic. Now, both of those microphones are amazing. I see you've got it in the vintage gray here, which I've not seen before. That looks rather gorgeous. Rather yeah, they rebranded gorgeous. those microphones a, a, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I think, yeah. to, to change, to, to make them more distinct from one another because all the microphones all the way up the line from their MA50 to their MA1000, uh, yeah. which is an amazing microphone, by the way. It is, um, yeah. They all looked identical. So they rebranded them all so that they all have a distinct look now. Um, still yes. the same microphones inside, and they've always been amazing. I, I love the MA200. I love the MA201. Um, I love the 1000 as well. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, amazing microphones all the way up and down their, their line. No, absolutely incredible. So we're definitely going to get one of those. Um, very excited. One of the 201 FETs. Now, um, we haven't yet talked about, of course, um, Royos. Um, we did talk about them as, as a, you know, an industry standard. I use that phrase again. I hate saying it, but I did. A, stand, <laughs> a microphone you see a lot. How about that? Which is the 121. But about, I don't know how, how many years ago, maybe four or five years ago, they brought out, four years ago, they brought out an, a Royer R10, which is, I'm looking over here for price, is a, about a $500 ribbon. And I'm going to really shoot myself in the foot, but I did say at the time, and I still strongly believe that this is my favorite Royer. I, I love this mic. It's 500 bucks, $499. They also do it, I see, with the DB Booster Pack, which I presume is like the cloud lifter. It's their version, yes? That kind of thing. I don't sure. want to minimalize it, but $500 for one of the best sounding ribbon microphones on the market. I mean, Please, if you've got the money, go out and buy a pair of R2121s. Uh, 122Vs are fantastic as well. A 122V is amazing on really overly bright electric guitars. I can tell you, Joe Perry likes his Marshall to be extremely loud and really, really bright. And we tried a 121 and it definitely improved it. And then we put a 122V on it and it was like, ah! it was like amazing. But that's not a cheap mic. That's not an inexpensive mic, shall I say, but an R10 is a $500 ribbon. Well, yeah, it's, it's a great microphone. So I wanted to kind of elaborate on that. You know, yes, the 121, please. like you said, is, is a standard and yep. we know we're going to get out of that. The uh, the R10, so as I understand the R121, they take a, a, a tube of metal or a solid yep. uh, piece of metal and actually uh, carve it out from the inside. Yep. There's a there's more of a manufacturing process that goes into that. The, the the size of the enclosure also is different, which th that does the size of the enclosure around the ribbon and the shape of it does go into, uh, does play quite a bit into the sound of yeah. a ribbon microphone. But there's no doubt, yeah, the R10 sounds like the same family. It's a little bit larger as well, so it's not quite as easy in some cases to position. But yeah, tossing it in front of a guitar cab or what have you, they're not difficult to position. I should. I say like that, the high but... end on it. It's hard to believe that it's yeah. a ribbon. It's got some beautiful, beautiful high end. I mean, I think the original demo we did, we put it on acoustic guitar and I was like, Oh, I was like, I couldn't, I'm like, this shouldn't sound this good on an acoustic guitar. It, it, it's great. It's a, I, I, you know, I think it's one of the best utilitarian mics on the market, 500 bucks and it's a ribbon. I mean, that, 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 that phrase utilitarian, you know, being useful for everything and also being a ribbon shouldn't actually work, but it does. It's a really great mic. So let's definitely get one of those, the R10s. And there are a couple of, of ribbons in that price point. SE makes some, um, the Voodoo series, which are actually really good microphones at that price price point as well. Voodoo? Um, a, a, yeah, the Voodoo series, VR1 and VR2, I believe. Um, AEA has their Nouveau series, which you know we talked a little earlier about. I think, you know, everybody watching, we will do more ribbons. And uh, Mike and I, I'm sure, will be talking about this. Um, you know, it would be great to get the R10 and the, the Voodoo VR1 um, up up and running and sort of like hear what they both sound like together. Um, it would be really fantastic. Um, the, the VI one here is only 399. And I do know a bunch of people that like them a lot. So that's uh, definitely an opportunity to uh, uh, try that out. There's a good deal here 
with a Voodoo VR1 bundle with a reflection filter and cable. Now, those people that know me know I'm not a big fan of reflection filters for most situations because what they tend to do is they put them around the back half of the mic and yet all the sound is coming from the front. However, it's, you know, it might reduce a little bit of the ambience in the room. It can help a little bit. However, with a ribbon mic, it's a really good idea because w when we were recording drums in, in Boston, we had a pair of um, Shaw ribbon mics, believe it or not. It was those red ones that the, when they bought that ribbon company. And they, of course, of course, they were permanently in figure of eight. So what we did is we put them above Joey's kit and we had the reflection from the back because we were getting too much ambience in the figure of eight from the back of the microphone. So we put the reflection. So actually this deal here, the Voodoo VR1 bundle with a reflection filter and cable, which is only, you know, which is affordable. It's $559 is actually a good deal if you want, because what you can do is you can use your, um, you could, you could get a pair of those or even just a single and use it as a room mic and use a reflection filter to shape how the ribbon mic hears the room. So you could put it actually in front of the kit and only pick up the ambience that's reflected, or you can do what we did and do the opposite and only get the direct sound. Um, so that's actually quite a good deal. I'm sure people are using it for vocals and stuff like that because of the reflection thing. But I actually think um, that's a really good idea because ribbon mics are beautiful on rooms, especially when you're working with drummers that are overly cymbal heavy, which seems to be more often than not what drummers do. They tend to smash the schnizzle out of the cymbals. It's like, boom, ja, da, dum, dum, da, you know? And so you, you a, a ribbon which is not traditionally overly bright and uh, uh, is, is a good choice for room mics anyway. So um, I just saw that, thought it was a good thing to point out. Yeah, and that's a great point because for live use or otherwise, taking some of the room out of the equation on yeah. a figure of eight microphone like that, most ribbons are figure of eight. There are things right. like, I think you mentioned the, the KU5 from AEA earlier. There are a handful of them that are uh, are made to be Well, Christian uh, was just cardioid. pointing out the um, R92 at seven ninety nine for an AEA product is, I would say, affordable. Now, obviously, that's not entry level, but considering it's got the AEA name on it, and I know Wes, we all know Wes, the guy's obsessional, um, and so that's going to be an incredibly well-made uh, microphone and the fact that they're Absolutely. doing one at seven. I haven't actually heard that. That's probably something I should try out. No, they're, they're great microphones. Most every ribbon microphone, because the ribbon is usually offset a little bit in the actual um, basket, the actual assembly of the microphone, will have a slightly different sound from the front and the back. This one has a reasonably pronounced difference as, as much as you get from the same ribbon that's picking up the same yeah. sound. Um, it has a pretty pronounced difference depending on how you orient it. So yeah, those are really cool microphones. Great. Well, uh, I think we're going to go with the R10. Um, I'm glad we talked about all the others and we will get to try some of those out. I mean, look, an M160 is one of my favorite microphones, the Bayer M160. I'm sure uh, people watching know that that is famously the Led Zeppelin drum sound microphone. Um, I'm a huge fan um, and we will do videos using it. But bearing in mind, we're trying to showcase things at certain price points. I think the R10 at $499 is fairly unbeatable. We will try the SE and we will try the R92 as well. That will come at a later date, so stay tuned. So just a couple more suggestions and things to go through. Um, the Mojave um, MA201 FET, I think we briefly talked about that. That at $799 is really good on my vocals. I really love that. Um, but the one thing we didn't get to is some of the higher end stuff. And everybody knows that I've, I've done the 940s and of course the 1040s, which the, those are the Lewitts. But I haven't yet heard the Loughton Atlantis. Now you're telling me it's got, what, three modes? Can you explain that a little bit to me? Yeah, so three modes on that thing. And this is not DSP. This is actually three separate circuits. So they have a, a neutral, a gentle, I think, and I'm going to forget the third one. I believe it's a forward uh, yep. voicing. And it's it's what you'd expect from you know how they're how they're named. More more scooped, more flat, and more mid of a mid push. But it's actually three separate circuits and it, great. they all sound great. And of course you can just like swapping out a microphone. In this case you'd just flip a switch and yeah, just a just a, a great mic. Brian Loudenschlager is the owner and designer for uh, uh loud microphones and I I love his stuff. We yeah. sent out a ton of those Atlantises, and 
they don't come back. No, I mean, it's a gorgeous looking mic. Yeah, I re really want to try one of these, I think. Um, we, we actually did, um, we did a review on Loughton several years ago where we went into, because um, a big user of Louter is a very good friend of mine, Daryl Thorpe, um, who we all know and love because he's Absolutely. stupidly talented and won nine Grammys, I think, as of this year. He won <laughs> two this year, add to his seven. So, and he's a big fan and he uses them. He uses them on records. So when you listen to Foo Fighter and Beck and Radiohead records he made, he was using Loughton microphones. Absolutely. He shows up at sessions with his microphones and uses them. And I, I, so I admire that. And that's a, that's a guy who walks the walk and talks the talk. And we did do a session with does. him at Sunset Sound only using Loughton mics, which you can download the multitrack. So why don't we should stick the link down below for that. Um, and they're fantastic microphones. Really, really good. But the Atlantis I have heard about from Trent, who's a mutual friend of both you and I, who uh, used to work at Sweetwater, didn't he? And now working he did. Now working at Loughton. So definitely excited to hear the Atlantis. And I'm, uh, we'll put it through its paces um, when we get it, and we'll see what it sounds like on all the different modes. I think we covered all the bases um, of, of a couple of old favorites and some new things. Uh, the SEs are new to me, so getting a couple of those. Um, the uh, Atlantis is new to me, um, and you've given us other things to chew over and think about for future videos. So, Mike, you absolutely rock. Thank you ever so much for all your help. Yeah, great talking with you. Let me know how you like all the microphones once you receive them. I'd be interested in your feedback. Yeah, I'm ex I'm ex I I'm, it's crazy that I've never used any SEs. So, you know, that's good. That's going to be... Uh, and knowing how successful you guys are with them, you know, to be able to hear those. Obviously, I know and love Lewitt, and I'm very excited that you guys are selling them now, and that's huge. And, of course, Mojave, like I said, the MA201 FET is, is my vocal mic. It's the one that makes me sound good. Well, no, no, that's pushing my luck. Makes me sound as good as I possibly could. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, of course, the Atlantis is uh, top of my uh, pile of mics to try. Yeah, having a good microphone definitely does not does not hurt your chances. No, exactly. Thanks ever so much. I really appreciate it. All right, we'll talk soon. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye. So I'm sitting here with a rather wonderful Mikhail Seeley. Hello. Hello. And we are going to do the first minute and 15 seconds of one of your songs. What's it called? It's called A Line. A Line. A Line, yes. Lovely. So what we're going to do is we're going to take six of the mics and we're going to record the acoustic guitar. And then in this lovely vocal booth that we just put up, we're going to record the same six mics. And between, I don't remember what it is, like two or $300 right up to about $1,500, we are going to cover the whole range. We, the video you have seen is a composite of all of those moments. And of course, as ever, you can download the multitracks and you can decide for yourself. We are not using any EQ, no compression, nothing on the way in. And every single one of them is going through the PreSonus Quantum 2626, which is a Thunderbolt eight input um, interface, which I have never used. So this is a baptism of fire for me as well. So this is gonna be fun. So without further ado, we're going to record the song. And even when I ask my mother, she doesn't seem to have an answer for me. It's a sad cycle when we don't want to feel Numbing the pain that fades away It's a mad cycle We play the blaming game Trust in ourselves We will align someday Trust in ourselves, we will align 
ask my mother She doesn't seem to have an answer for me It's a sad cycle when we do on a field Numbing the pain that fades away It's a mad cycle we play the blaming game Trust in ourselves We will align someday Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even when I ask my mother She doesn't seem to have an answer for me It's a sad cycle when we don't want to feel Numbing the pain that fades away It's a mad cycle we play the blaming game Trust in ourselves And even when I ask my mother She doesn't seem to have an answer for me It's a sad cycle when we don't want to feel Numbing the pain that fades away It's a mad cycle we play the blaming game Trust in ourselves We will align someday Thanks everybody, there will be a cheat sheet down here, so please download that. Um, also, of course, leave some comments and questions below and tell us your experiences. We really want to know what your experiences have been. This uh, has been a fascinating um, journey and would love to know how your particular home studio build is either going or has gone. Thanks everyone, thanks Mike. So long, farewell, avidezen, au revoir, adios, ciao, goodbye.